Okay, this lecture is obesity, uh, part four, causes of obesity. And I'm gonna start out here with this slide called the four horsemen of the obesity apocalypse. So this comes from, you know, the metaphor comes from the book of Revelations in the Bible written by John of Patmos in exile. And I made a mnemonic for the four horsemen of the apocalypse. I just made this up because I think it's a quick way to remember it and summarize it. So M for meat. Typical meat's about 50% fat. Even the leanest meat's about 25%. Like lean chicken, for example, that's really high fat. I want my dietary fat below 10%. Oil is 100% fat. Oils are terrible. You don't want to eat them. Um, and then the next O is for obesogen. That's so obesogenic chemicals, chemicals that cause obesity. And then F for fructose. Fructose is very unusual sugar that in large amounts promotes obesity. Um, so the mnemonic is MOOF. MOOF. Um, gives you the four so-called horsemen of the obesity apocalypse. And so the part of the Bible this comes from is from Revelation chapter 6, verses 1 through 8. And just for fun, I'll read you the, this real quick, because a lot of people say that these are relevant to current events. So here it is from the Bible. Chapter 6, book of Revelations. The first seal, the conqueror. Now I saw when the Lamb opened one of the seals, and I heard one of the four living creatures saying with a voice like thunder, Come and see. And I looked, and behold, the white horse. He who sat on it had a bow and a crown. So here's the white horse. He who sits on it has a crown and a bow. Doesn't necessarily have an arrow there. That's a point of debate. And the crown was given to him, and he went out conquering and to conquer. Okay, so is he conquering with pestilence and plague, or is he the white symbol of purity and faith and religion? That's debatable. Okay, so then the second seal, the conflict on earth. When he opened the second seal, the lamb, the lamb symbolizes Christ. I heard the second living creature saying, Come and see, another horse, fiery red, went out, and it was granted to the one who sat on it to take peace from the earth and that people should kill one another, and there was given to him a great sword. So the red symbolizes blood and potentially war, it is thought, possibly civil war. Um, so that is the rider on the red horse with a sword. Okay, then the third seal, opened by Jesus Christo. Third seal, scarcity on earth. When he opened the third seal, I heard the living creature say, Come and see. So I looked, and behold, a black horse. And he who sat on it had a pair of scales in his hand. So here's the black horse, and those are the scales. And I heard a voice in the midst of the four living creatures saying, A quart of wheat for a denarius, and three quarts of barley for a denarius, and do not harm the oil and the wine. So the gist of it is that it is a time of famine, and that the food portions are being rationed out. And a denarius was basically a day's salary. So people could barely get by. Um, and a lot of people were starving to death. Okay, then the fourth seal, and this is the pale rider on a pale horse, and Clint Eastwood made a movie about that. The fourth seal. When he opened the fourth seal, I heard the voice of the fourth living creature saying, Come and see. So I looked, and behold, a pale horse, and the name of him who sat on it was Death, and Hades followed with him. And the power was given to them over a fourth of the earth to kill with the sword and with hunger and with death and by the beasts of the earth. So anyways, that's from the book of Revelations. Does that correspond to modern events or not? I'll leave that up to you to decide. Um, the person who painted this was Viktor Mikhailovich Vaznetsov. Uh, he was a Russian artist in the 1800s. And I'm just saying, is Russia back in the 1800s had lots of really talented people and made some great literature and great paintings. And um, anyway, so there's the lamb up there who opened up the four seals. So the white horse, the red horse, the black horse, and the pale rider on a pale horse. The four horsemen of the apocalypse and revelations. And here are the four horsemen causing obesities. So if you want to avoid obesity, avoid meat. No meat, no oil. Minimize exposure to obesogens and minimize your fructose, especially industrial fructose, processed fructose. Regular fructose in fruits isn't as big of a deal, but that's a whole big topic. We'll get to that later. Okay, so now fructose. Why is fructose so different? This is an AO alert. AO means academic orgasm. This is pretty interesting stuff. Fructose is sweeter than glucose or sucrose, so processed food companies, they want to put more fructose in there because it tastes good. People like it. It's really sweet. Um, 
fructose in general, the consumption of it's been going up. There's a little bit of a down track in the sense that when people started trading soft drinks for bottled water, there was a little bit of a drop in fructose consumption. Fructose is usually, um, in fruits, it's usually good, and it comes packaged with the fruits, fiber, antioxidants, and you tend to eat smaller amounts, but fruits can be addictive, and you can eat a whole lot of them. If you're one of these marathon triathlete persons, you know, you can handle it, but if you're not exercising a lot, and a younger person maybe have higher metabolism, some of the older people, you got to be careful, it doesn't make you fat. McDougal recommends limiting fruits to only two servings or less per day, okay? A lot of people eat much more than that, myself included. Um, but, you know, again, uh, you got to exercise some or you're going to potentially get yourself fat. High fructose corn syrup became very popular, especially around in the 1980s and later. Typically, it'll claim to have 55% or less fructose, but it's been shown. A guy named Garand did some research on it and he showed that it very often has 65% fat, fructose in it. So that's a lot. And then the fructose was routinely contaminated with mercury. This lady, Renoi Joy Dufault, she's kind of a heroic lady. She wrote a book called Unsafe at Any Meal, and she had discovered in her research that the high fructose corn syrup was contaminated with mercury. And in her current job at that time, she couldn't publish that result research. Because, you know, the way academia works, it's not like it's free speech. In academia, you're sort of hired to get grant money and to publish stuff that the person with, who gives you the grant money wants published. So when you publish something that bad mouths a product coming from a corporation, people would get fired. They wouldn't be allowed to publish the, the data. She actually quit her job. She was so concerned about this so she could publish her data on high fructose corn syrup and wrote a whole book about it. And the food companies would actually be proud of the high fructose corn syrup being contaminated with mercury because it's a good preservative. Uh, you'll see they put mercury, like remember in thimerosal and all the contact lenses, prevents you know mold or other bacterial things from growing. So anyways... Um, that's why it was in there. They would advertise high fructose corn syrup as a preservative. So some people really eat a lot of this stuff, so they're getting exposed to a lot of mercury. Not good. It's a neurotoxin. Oh, fructose uh, on absorption from the gut, it travels via the portal vein to the liver. Now that's unique. Glucose, when it's absorbed, goes all over the body, so the, all the cells of the body can metabolize it. Versus fructose just goes to the liver, goes through the portal vein, which connects the gut to the liver, and then the liver has to deal with it. So if you're eating it in relatively small amounts from fruits, you give the liver more time as the fibers peeled off to slowly absorb it and decide what to do with it. But when you have a bolus of fructose in one of these sweetened beverages, I call that industrial fructose, um, it enters glycolysis in the second half of glycolysis. The second half of glycolysis is a three-carbon phase. I'll show you a diagram of this in just a moment. But basically, it, goes, it enters in the three-carbon phase, which is beyond the major regulatory step of PFK. PFK means phosphofructokinase, and that is tightly regulated based on the energy charge of the cell. So if there's a lot of ATP around, that means there's plenty of energy, and PFK won't run. But if the cell is low on energy, it says, yeah, we need to make some energy, let's burn some glucose. But the problem with fructose is it comes in after this phase, in the second half of glycolysis, in the three-carbon phase, and so it just rushes down the second half of glycolysis, entering at the DHAP and glyceraldehyde part of the three-carbon part of uh, glycolysis. And because of that, it just really quickly gets made into pyruvate, and then that gets made into acetyl-CoA. The liver doesn't know what to do with it, and it'll typically just make that into fat when, when it gets a big bolus. All right. Um, gets diverted away from Krebs cycle, where it would normally go for energy production, and gets used to make fatty acids. So you're making all this fat in the liver. What do you think happens? it predisposes the patient to get a fatty liver. And once they get a fatty liver, that messes up the ability of the liver to sense the blood glucose level. So you get insulin resistance in the liver, and that's a problem. Now you start getting fasting hyperglycemia. So when you had insulin resistance in the skeletal muscle, you would get postprandial after eating hyperglycemia. But when you get insulin resistance in the liver, now you get it during fasting as well, around the clock, both uh, postprandial and fasting hyperglycemia. That's bad. Um, papers have shown that the, uh, the liver enzymes start drifting upward as an indicator when the blood glucose levels are about to skyrocket with uh, full-blown type 2 diabetes. Okay, fatty liver can lead to increased uh, fat release from the liver, triglycerides and VLDL into the blood, hyperlipidemia, that's why it's so atherogenic, and that's part of why it's so atherogenic. Fertilis causes overeating because it doesn't cause satiety, satisfaction of hunger. And there's several reasons for that. First of all, it doesn't elevate blood glucose too much because it's just going to the liver and it's not glucose. Okay, and because it doesn't elevate blood glucose much, it has a low glycemic index, it doesn't increase insulin that much initially. 
And because it doesn't increase insulin that much, it doesn't increase leptin that much. And so there's no leptin going to the brain, you know, the CDID hormone saying shut off the hunger drive. And that's one of the things I noticed. I could easily eat 10 apples and still want more. I could easily eat 48 ounces of blueberry and still want more. But you can't eat potatoes in that way. You know, sweet potatoes, it takes effort to eat those regular starches. And because of that, you can overeat. I sometimes wondered if somebody sprayed MSG on those apples. They were too damn good. I mean, I couldn't stop eating them. It was like eating pizza in the old days, okay? So I actually stopped eating apples. I was worried about what the covering was on the apples. It was sort of thick. You can't really wash it off. I'm wondering, does that get absorbed in my body? Is that atherogenic? And they won't tell you. I went all over the place trying to look it up, and I couldn't find it. So I stopped eating apples for that reason. Um, all right, and it's even on the organic apples, that waxy stuff. Excessive dietary fructose can lead to, it does lead to increased uric acid. And so high uric acid in the blood is called hyperuricemia. Hyperuricemia in the blood is bad for two major reasons. First of all, uric acid is a bridging molecule. It's six red blood cells together, you know, causing a low formation where the RBCs are stuck together like sandwiches, and that's prothrombotic. It also causes blood pressure to go up. Hyperuricemia inhibits nitric oxide, endothelial nitric oxide, called ENOS, E-N-O-S, endothelial nitric oxide synthase. So that decreases nitric oxide bioavailability, especially in the skeletal muscle. Part of how insulin gets the blood glucose to be taken up by the skeletal muscle is causing vasodilation in the muscle. If you inhibit vasodilation, then you can't get the glucose into the muscle, into the muscle glycogen, so it stays high in the blood. That's what that's all about. I'll show a diagram. It'll make more sense in a moment. So I'm letting you hear it twice because it'll make it easier to remember. So here's a paper showing why fructose does not raise leptin and does not satisfy hunger. And because it doesn't satisfy hunger, people tend to overeat. And that's why I think this is nature's way of enabling an animal to get fat, let's say, before winter because it can overeat way beyond its hunger drive with this fructose stuff. So fructose is, goes hand in hand with overeating. That's important to know doesn't cause satiety. And you'll hear McDougal talking about, eat starch, eat starch, starch will satisfy your hunger. Fructose does not satisfy your hunger. And he doesn't specifically say fructose, but it, fruits don't satisfy your hunger is how he would phrase it. But that's this is the reason why, you know, like I said, for me, I could easily eat 10 apples and still want more. Um, I've had that experience eating fruits and I can zoom through the blueberries, but I can't zoom through my starches. Okay, here's a really important slide. This is this is worth you can hit the print screen button and remember this one. This is this is big stuff here on why fructose can cause problems. So glucose comes into the liver and it runs through glycolysis. Here's PFK, phosphofructokinase, and that's a very heavily tightly regulated enzyme. So when there's a lot of ATP around, adenosine triphosphate, that means the energy charge of the cell is high, so there's no reason to run glucose through glycolysis. Okay, you can just store it as glycogen. However, um, beyond this step, now you go from the six carbon phase to the three carbon phase part of glycolysis. When fructose comes in, it gets phosphorylated to fructose one phosphate, and the ATP used to phosphorylate it goes to ADP, adenosine diphosphate. So it starts out with ATP triphosphate, three phosphates, goes to adenosine diphosphate, two phosphates. And then that gets degraded into uric acid. Then that goes into the blood, that uric acid. And that's going to cause high uric acid in the blood and everything that goes with that. But here's the real key point. Fructose is split into the three carbons, three carbon components, like glyceraldehyde, three phosphate, and DHEPs, dihydroxyacetone phosphate. So it's entering glycolysis at this point at the three carbon phase, way past all the major regulatory steps. So when somebody drinks industrial fructose, like one of these fructose-sweetened beverages, junk food things, it just zooms down to the end of glycolysis, and the liver has nothing to do with it. It just makes it into fat, so you get a fatty liver. Once you get a fatty liver, then you get insulin resistance in the liver. Basically, fatty liver is like diabetes of the liver, and that then leads to hyperlipidemia, high lipids in the blood, like the very low-density lipids, VLDLs, go up in the blood. Triglycerides go up in the blood, and that's atherogenic, hyperlipidemia. Okay, so this shows <clears throat> these major problems of fructose, not satisfying hunger, causing hyperlipidemia, causing fatty liver. Fatty liver is, fatty, is liver diabetes, okay? Um, so that's pretty interesting. Like I said, here's the paper showing how, this is the guy, Garan, this is showing how high fructose corn syrup quite often is actually 65%, not 55% or less like they used to try to claim in the past. 
Um, here's several different papers showing how fructose causes hyperlipidemia and insulin resistance. Um, here's a paper talking about how the high fructose corn syrup was prepared from mercury chloralkali plants. Rene Dufault is a lady I told you who wrote that book, Unsafe at Any Food Unsafe at Any Meal. So it's a very good book about food additives and contaminants. Um, this lady, Jane Hightower, wrote a good book. I think it was called Diagnosis Mercury. It's about all these yuppies becoming demented because they were eating a lot of fish with mercury in it. So they both collaborated together on this paper to write about the problem of mercury in high fructose corn syrup. So here's the paper, and here's the joke I made that when you increase shelf life, you decrease brain life because you're doing it with mercury preservatives. Not a good idea. And how the industry liked it, you know. Gosh, not good. Okay, the effect of high fructose for weight maintained diet. Basically, you know, you eat more fructose, you get more fatty liver. When, and especially that's with industrial fructose. Because I know there's other people out there. Just so you know, I'm just going to be fair on the other. There's another opinion on this. There's people like Durian Ryder, and I like Durian, and he's an impressive guy, and he knows a lot about nutrition. And he's going to tell you how he eats a lot of sugar, and his girlfriends eat sugar, and they're all real skinny. But they're also rather athletic people who exercise a lot, and they're relatively young. Okay, um, other people are going to tell you, like Mike Arnstein, he's an ultra marathoner and he eats 25 to 30 pounds of fruit a day and he's fine. Yeah, but he's eating fruit. He's not eating processed junk food. And he's a, you know, a hyper athletic guy, an ultra marathoner, okay, tons of exercise there. And there's other nutrition experts who will tell you a lot of so called fruitarians, people who eat a lot of fruits, they're quite healthy and thin. But again, they're usually relatively young and they exercise a lot. Garth Davis will tell you he's seen a lot of skinny, healthy fruitarians. You'll see the Mastering Diabetes guys, um, you know, Cyrus, uh, Kumbada, and Bobby Bitteru. They both eat lots of fruits. But again, they're both relatively young athletic guys. So anyways, like I said, there's two ways of looking at this. And the fruits are certainly a much, much, much better food. And I think we're kind of designed to eat fruits. Uh, but that's different than this modern processed industrial fructose stuff with mercury in it. Okay, And er mercury itself is a metalloestrogen. So here's, here's just one paper on it. Fructose, again, enters the liver, gets phosphorylated to fructose 1-phosphate. The phosphates from ADP, ATP, the AT, ADP, now because it's minus a phosphate, it's dye for two phosphates, goes to uric acid. That causes hyperuricemia, uric acid in the blood. That inhibits endothelial nitric oxide, meaning the vasodilator production. Therefore, you can't vasodilate the little arterioles in the muscle. Therefore, the insulin can't fully do its job. So it causes insulin resistance because it can't open those arteries in the muscle. So it can't speed up the rate of glucose uptake to make glycogen in the skeletal muscle. Normally, 80% of postprandial glucose is taken up by the skeletal muscle to make um, glycogen in the muscle. That's what's supposed to happen. But it can't happen because you can't open the arteries to get more access to muscle tissue. Okay, this is just another paper showing <clears throat> you know, basically the same thing in a slightly different context. And that's why fructose causing insulin resistance is a problem. So if you want to minimize your body weight, you want to minimize insulin resistance. And so minimizing your intake of industrial fructose is a big step in that direction. Okay, and that's the end of obesity, causes of obesity, part four.